Hi there, this is Eddie Esquivel with CoreOS, and we will go ahead and do a intro and demo to Tectonic and Quay today um, with this webinar. Um, welcome to all you folks on, on the air. So yeah, my name is Eddie Esquivel. I'm a solutions engineer here at CoreOS. I'm based in San Francisco. You can feel free to reach me via um, email or LinkedIn or Twitter, as you can see on the screen. And I just want to go ahead and set the table of what we're doing with Tectonic and then go ahead and dive into the demo. We'll be taking questions at the end of the webinar. So Kubernetes, it's great. Um, hopefully some of you have had a chance to kick the tires on a Kubernetes cluster and, and been amazed by um, the features that are available to you out of the box. But how do we go ahead and take something that's already great um, and make it even better. Well, that's the goal with Tectonic. With Tectonic, we're going ahead and taking pure upstream Kubernetes um, and wrapping it with enterprise features that folks um, really need and desire um, to be fully productive with their Kubernetes cluster. So there's a few different types of personas and uh, different things that we go ahead and wrap into Tectonic to make it really useful. So first of all, it's the way we install, the portability layer. We leverage Terraform to go ahead and install on a, a series of different cloud providers on bare metal and VMware. And what that allows you to do is you get to pick the cloud or the environment and we can go ahead and install on there. So that's important for a lot of folks that are looking to go ahead and execute on that um, you know, multi-cloud strategy or perhaps uh, being able to install on bare metal and then also burst up into the cloud as load de um, demands it. Some of the other personas that we're looking to address and uh, um, really cater to with the Tectonic platform are the infrastructure owners and the operators. These folks are interested in painless patching, right? They don't want to have a fire drill whenever there is a CVE in the Linux kernel or in the Kubernetes code base. They want to be able to drive these updates easily, which is something that we can go ahead and do with Tectonic running on Container Linux. They're also looking for governance, right? They want to be able to lock down the system with RBAC, um, be, able, be able to integrate um, with their existing LDAP and SAML, uh, and they also want to be alerted if anything happens to the applications or to the system itself. They want to be able to uh, know and be able to re remediate the situation. So. These are some of the features that we're looking to deliver with Tectonic um, for our infrastructure owners and operators. The other persona that we're also targeting is the developers and engineers, right? So as a developer, you want to be able to go ahead and make code changes and deploy quickly and seamlessly to your Kubernetes cluster. Um, the less you have to think about it, the better off you're going to be. So we go ahead and enable that type of CI/CD pipeline with Way, which is our enterprise registry, uh, and we'll go ahead and, and demo some neat features that are available with Quay. And being CoreOS, um, we have a, a huge focus on security. Um, Auth and RBAC are on by default. These are not optional. Um, also, uh, at CoreOS, we feel strongly that the best way to stay secure is to really be able to push the updates and patches to your environment um, as quickly as possible, right? So if there's the CVE with the name of it, um, kind of like Stack Clash last week or a couple weeks ago, uh, we want to be able to go ahead and identify that CVE and push the updates to your system ASAP. So one of the things that Tectonic also enables is it allows you to go ahead and get locked in with the various cloud services, right? So for example, um, you know, take something like Amazon Athena or one of these other cloud services. Um, they're great, they make life a lot easier, but they do come at a cost. So why don't we go ahead and take um, open source software that does what some of these services aim to do, and let's go ahead and automate the operation of these pure open source services and deploy them on Tectonic, right? So you get the convenience of a managed service at the cost of an open source uh, project. So that's really what we're looking to build on top of Tectonic. And we've been able to do that with a few different services. So some of the services and, and operators that we've already built into Tectonic 
um, are really uh, around being able to update Kubernetes, um, etcd operator, and also the Prometheus operator with other operators um, being built and in the pipeline. So great, um, with that introduction and overview of Tectonic and really what we're trying to do with um, the platform, let's go ahead and dive into a demo where we can actually highlight some of these key features. I'm gonna cut over to my Tectonic cluster. And once you go ahead and log on to Tectonic via the authentication panel, this is the console that you can see. Um, and you'll notice that all of the primitives are neatly lined up on the left side. There's the administration tab as well where we can handle stuff like updates and RBAC. So some of the features I wanted to highlight here um, are really around how we install Tectonic, which I think is a huge value add and really allows us to go ahead and drive the in-place updates of Kubernetes itself, right? So what do I mean by the way we install? So if I take a look on workloads here and take a look at um, daemon sets, and I go ahead and select the cube system namespace, we're gonna notice that the API server is actually running on Kubernetes. In this particular cluster, you'll notice I have three pods, which means I, I really have three master nodes. Um, but, I mean, that's pretty fantastic. It's, uh, it's the fact that we're able to run the control plane, uh, the API server, um, the, if I take a look at the replica sets, the controllers and the schedulers on Kubernetes, means that we can now leverage Kubernetes deployment um, paradigms to go ahead and do these updates in place and pretty easily, right? It essentially um, becomes a problem that is relatively easy to handle with a Kubernetes API, right? So if you can do a rolling upgrade of Nginx servers um, to the latest version of your application, you can do the same thing with these Kubernetes control components. So that, I think that's one of the really nice features. Um, this is all managed via the administration tab. So if we head over to cluster settings, um, we'll notice that we have the tectonic operator. Um, if we were to have any updates there, we could go ahead and check for updates. It would say, hey, you can update, and we can go ahead and execute the updates. Uh, we happen to be running the latest version of tectonic and Kubernetes, um, 1.67 here, okay? So I think that's one of the really neat features. Uh, the other feature I wanted to highlight is really around RBAC. When we talk about being able to lock down the cluster, um, what folks are looking for is granularity and Kubernetes um, definitely allows you to do that. So if we take a look at roles here, um, there's one role in particular that I like to highlight that really shows how granular you can get with the permissions on Kubernetes. So if I click on this view role, we can see that a typical role in Kubernetes involves actions against an API group um, working on resources, right? So if you wanted to go ahead and create a role that would only allow you to get namespaces, you can go ahead and do that. You can lock it down to that degree. Uh, not gonna be super useful for you, but you can go ahead and do that if you want to. So you can go ahead and build out roles for the different folks in your organization and bind them to groups in LDAP um, so that you can go ahead and easily track these roles and map them to users. So that was one of the other features I wanted to highlight. Um, I wanted to cut over to Quay now and highlight. I'm going to be using Quay.io um, to highlight some of the features here, um, but we also have a Quay Enterprise which you can deploy behind your firewall and leverage all of these features and many more um, in your uh, essentially a private repository. So if we head over to Quay, um, you get the, the screen where you can you can see your repositories. I'm going to go ahead and click on a uh, repo here called this the Spark Base repo. I'm going to click on tags, and we can actually see. Um, the security scan column here. And what we're doing here is leveraging Claire to scan the images and identify any vulnerabilities on, in them. So if I click on Sun Fixable um, here, we can actually see what vulnerabilities are in this container. I can actually link back to the actual CVE itself, if so interested. And we can see what's going on with my container. How safe is it? How secure is it? How 
can I make it even more secure? Um, is it just a matter of doing an app get update in my container and updating the binary? Um, if so, what command do I need to run? So um, this is really a, a neat feature, right? We're not going to say uh, that containers in and of themselves are a security mechanism, but if we go ahead and do the security vulnerability scanning of the image before pushing it, we can go ahead and make sure that the container is that much more secure. So that's one of the features I wanted to highlight with Quay. Uh, the other one I wanted to highlight is really around the notion of being able to build um, containers based on a GitHub webhook. So for example, let me go ahead and click on this simple web app repository. If I click on the build link here, we'll notice that we have a build trigger associated with a GitHub repo, right? So essentially, anytime I commit to this GitHub repo, it's going to kick off a Docker build, and I can go ahead and take this new image and deploy to Kubernetes, right? So let's go ahead and see that in action. So in Tectonic, under workloads, I'm going to head over to deployments. I'm going to head over to my personal namespace, and I'm going to see that I have an application up and running, right? So if I look at the YAML, um, just basic deployment YAML, we're going to see that I'm referencing this repository and this particular tag. If I head over to the um, service load balancer endpoint, um, I can see that that is my application. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a change to this index.html uh, and see that this is in fact going to kick off a build for me. So if I head over to index.html in GitHub, I can go ahead and edit the file. For example, I can, um, you know, for example, just remove some comments here. Commit to master. If we head back over to Quay, we'll notice that this GitHub webhook is triggered and we have a build being executed within um, Quay, right? So if you're a developer, it, it really all it involves is committing your code and having Quay go ahead and build your image. Now, how do you go ahead and get this latest image into Kubernetes, say I went ahead and make a change. I want to change the image that I'm displaying on my application. I can go ahead into Tectonic. You could do this via CICD, via Jenkins or something, um, or you could do it manually. Um, let's just go ahead and change the tag here and watch the rolling deployment of my application happen. So I'm going to go ahead and click. Um, let me just make sure I have the correct tag here. Hardcore OS. I'm going to go ahead and update that tag here. I'm going to click on change, save changes. And if we click on pods, we can actually see the rolling upgrade happen to that service in Kubernetes. And it happened in the blink of an eye. I went ahead, it went ahead and deleted the old pod and spun up new pods. So if I go over to my application and I do a hard refresh here, we should see the new logo here. So we can see that pretty easily we were able to go ahead and commit code. Um, depend on Quay to go ahead and build the container, and with just a simple edit of my deployment YAML in Kubernetes, um, see this latest version of the application um, to get displayed. Right. So this is just a very trivial and simple example of how a CI/CD pipeline could be executed. Um, you're going to obviously be using something a little more advanced than manually editing tags in YAML, um, perhaps a Jenkins or Concourse or Etc. I've seen them all in the wild, and um, they work pretty well. So that was what I wanted to go ahead and accomplish with this demo. If there are any questions, we can go ahead and take them now. Okay, great. So. Great question. So the first question is, what is the cross-cloud story for Tectonic? And um, really, the cross-cloud story, we're doing a couple of things here, right? So first of all, we, wanna, we need to be able to install Tectonic on different clouds, right? So that's where the Terraform-based installer really allows us to readily spin up um, installers for new environments, right? So currently, we have Azure, uh, we have AWS, we have Veramental, and we have VMware. 
Um, we're working on OpenStack and potentially GCE down the road. Um, so that's kind of step one, phase one. Um, the next step would be go ahead and set up a federated control plane that really allows you to deploy applications across these um, different clusters. Um, and really we're focusing and working with the open source community. Um, some initial um, federation uh, uh, you know, items on the to-do list are, are being released in Kubernetes 1.7. So we're really looking for the Federation API to mature in 1.8, perhaps 1.9 timeframe. Great question. Another question is, should I be running data intensive or storage based apps on Kubernetes? That, that is also a great question. So if we're running on AWS, we have this idea of a persistent volume. This is a Kubernetes primitive. And what we could do is attach EBS volumes to my pods. Um, and, and have data intensive applications run that way. If you're running on bare metal, um, it's gonna take a little more effort. You can spin up something like a Ceph or a Gluster um, and you know, something like a Rook or Portworks or a Quartermaster would allow you to go ahead and leverage that shared storage and attach it to your pods. Um, in terms of should you, I would say definitely. I've seen customers running uh, HDFS, um, I've seen customers running Elasticsearch, CockroachDB, these various different state intensive applications on Kubernetes with, with success for sure. At the end of the day, yes, it's a container, um, but at the end of the day, we're, it's, it's simply a process running on a Unix box, right? With access to some shared storage medium. Okay. So another question, um, great questions by the way, um, what are the benefits of running the operating system container Linux with Kubernetes, right? So container Linux, um, I, it's, it's what's powering Tectonic, right? It's running under the hood. I, I didn't really demo it, but what it really allows you to do is um, run an operating system that's built for containers. It's slim, it's lightweight, it really minimizes the attack vector in terms of um, you know, security vulnerabilities. And one of the really neat features is that it allows you to update it in place, right? So if I head over to administration and I take a look at cluster settings, we're gonna notice that in addition to the tectonic operator, there's also a container Linux operator, right? So if um, there were to be some sort of CVE that comes up and we go ahead and push an update of the kernel to our container Linux servers around the world, you go ahead and see this updating um, in kind of a round robin fashion, all of the servers in your cluster, um, pretty much transparent to you, the user. Right? So I think that's uh, at a minimum some of the features that you get with container Linux that you wouldn't get with um, a, a typical operating system. Okay. Another question, um, what is the difference between upstream Kubernetes and Tectonic, right? So we definitely do not fork and patch Kubernetes. We are using open source Kubernetes. The real value add comes around the updates, being able to do in-place updating of your Kubernetes cluster and some of the other components around um, authentication. So for example, if you wanted to go ahead and integrate with LDAP, we have an open source project called DEX that we bundle within Tectonic that allows you to go ahead and do that authentication. If you will need a single sign-on with like Okta, DEX can also handle that for you. Okay, so great. Thank you all very much for the questions and your time this afternoon. Um, please feel free to reach out uh, again via my email or um, sales at corewest.com. Thank you.